It is my pleasure to introduce um, our next speaker, uh, Mickey McManus. Uh, Mickey is a research fellow at Autodesk, as well as chairman and principal of Maya Design, uh, a design consultancy and innovation lab. He's a pioneer in the fields of pervasive computing, collaborative innovation, human-centered design, and education. Mickey holds nine patents in the area of connected products, vehicles, and services, and spearheaded the launch of Maya's pervasive computing practice to help companies kickstart innovation around business challenges in a vastly connected world where, I think we should observe, uh, connected devices now outnumber people. In 2012, Mickey co-authored uh, the book that uh, perhaps many of you have read called Trillions, Thriving in the Emerging Information Ecology, uh, a field guide to the future when computing will be freely accessible in the ambient environment. And uh, that book, Trillions, was actually awarded the Axiom Gold Award in 2013 for best business book about technology and the 2013 Carnegie Science Award in the Science Communicator category. Mickey speaks frequently about pervasive computing, design, and business innovation. He has lectured at Carnegie Mellon University, where my son is a grad student, uh, Illinois Institute of Technology, Luma Institute, MIT, Princeton, University of Illinois, UC Berkeley, and UCLA. His work has been published in Bloomberg Business Week, Fortune, Fast Company, The Wall Street Journal, and the Harvard Business Review. Please give a warm welcome to Mickey McManus. So today, what I want to talk to you a little bit about um, what happens when the very nature of things changes. And, and we're all manufacturers, we're all thinking about how do we actually grow a thriving community, but what happens when our things and the very nature of things changes? What happens when our places change? What happens when Ira mentioned, I wrote a book called Trillions. It's really about the Internet of Things becomes a, a, a very different space because the, the things we interact with are, are very different. And how do we change our mindset when this happens? And, and I don't think it's going to be the same mindset that we have today. And so that's what I want to talk about. It'll be sort of a whirlwind tour of some of the things that I see out there as a futurist and as a researcher uh, into where the world is possibly going and maybe places we could, we could bring forward and, and make maybe a future that we'd like to have. So in, in a sense, this is about the changing nature of things. A few years ago, I wrote a book. And uh, in, in essence, I'll talk today about a sequel to that book, really, um, something I'm working on uh, to look into the future. But this was sort of a field guide to the Internet of Things plus, 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 a world saturated with computing. Think of a trillion connected things um, and, and, and what that means. So an era of, of uh, I think, almost a sea of information devices that we will all be living within. Now that book talked, uh, it sort of has a, has a chapter guide that looks like a climb across two mountains. And it talked about the first mountain of, of complexity and manufacturing and, and innovation as sort of the 20th century, the, the rise of computing and how that changed just about everything in our lives. And if you think about it, we climbed this mountain of computing in the 20th century from, um, I think the fax machine was 1925 up to, uh, up to uh, Unix, which was the operating system running on a lot of your phones. That was 1969. Before 1970, we invented the laser, the microchip, satellites, and a bunch of things. And a lot of that was enabled by computation. Um, and we did a lot of work to get here. So to give you a sense of this mountain we climbed in the 20th century, we now make more microprocessors than humans every year. We make 10 billion microprocessors a year. And we make more transistors than grains of rice, and we make them cheaper. And so we've sort of climbed this amazing mountain of complexity. I think of it as almost PC peak, because it's sort of supercomputers in your pocket. And today, you can, you can swipe your finger across a piece of glass and talk to somebody on the other side of the planet. And you can type 140 characters, and you can foment a revolution. Now, that's kind of amazing. Like, yay, humanity. We did it. We, we, we got to the top of this mountain. But a funny thing happens when you climb a mountain, and I don't know how many people, how many people here have done, gone, gone out and done any mountaineering? I, I just was climbing the Atlas Mountains uh, last week. So, so, you know, you get to the top of this hill, and you're like, wow, I did it. And right over the hill, you see that that was just the foothill. And there's this much bigger mountain that was being hidden by this first hill. You're like, oh, darn, I've got a lot more to go. And I think that's the same case with, with what's happening in, in, in our world today with with, uh, with innovation and computing. We get to the top of this mountain, we have 10 billion supercomputers in our pockets, and we, we look out, out ahead and we see that there's a much bigger hill. And that hill is trillions. And in fact, most analysts agree that we are less than five years away from having a trillion computational devices in our world. 
So not 10 billion, which is what we make every year, but a trillion. So it's really hard to get that in your head. And, and when, when I was writing the book, I asked a lot of people, like, how could I, how could I help people really understand how big a trillion is? Because this is coming. And they said, well, a wise man said, uh, count back in seconds. Like, that's a good way to think about how big a big number is. How big is a trillion? Well, we'll start with a, a million. I want everyone to think right now, how far back is a million seconds from right this moment? How far back is a million seconds? So, so how big is a trillion? We'll start with a million. How far back is a million? So a million was like a week and a half ago. That's not so bad. How many people got that right or close? Anybody? Yeah, no, me neither. <laughs> All right, what, tell me, what did you guys think? Did anybody have, anybody have an answer? Yeah, it's just, this is a tough one. Okay, now I'm gonna do a little more. A, a million's a week and a half. How far back is a billion seconds from right now? Manufacturers, uh, you know, you don't have to really be great at math, but, and I'm not either. Um, but when I, when I was first challenged, what's that? 20 years? So someone, someone was like six months, 20 years. I thought, uh, well, I was totally off by like a decade. Um, but how far back is a billion seconds? So how far back is a billion seconds? Well, you weren't, weren't too far off, right? That was the 1980s. That was right around the time we agreed on the 8-bit byte to bundle up you know, packets of information. Uh, that was a pretty heady time. So 30 years ago, the 1980s is a billion. So now I think everyone's ready, right? A million's a week and a half, a billion's um, 30 years ago. So, so don't shout it out, just in your head, try to think about how far back is a trillion. And this is, this is the test of if you're listening to me, don't shout it out, just in your head. Raise your hand if you actually have an answer. Let's see how we can do. If you have an answer, how far back is a trillion seconds? So I'll wait until a few more hands come up. Trillion seconds, okay. So let's check it out. Uh, I wasn't very good at math. Uh, but a trillion seconds, so I actually guessed something like the 1500s. But it turns out a trillion seconds is 30,000 years ago. The secret is just adding zeros. Um, it's, it's a one with 12 zeros. And so, so a trillion seconds ago from right now, we were living in caves. We were trying to get dogs to like us. It was right around the time we domesticated dogs because we'd probably been kicked out of those caves. We needed some friend somewhere. Um, so, so that is how big a trillion is. And we're less than five years away from having a trillion connected things. We're fundamentally gonna go from information in computers to us living in the information. And so, so it's a done deal. This is happening purely for economic reasons. If I can have a connection to somewhere, I can actually start actually getting feedback from it. I can make it a better product. I can make it a better service. So this is happening. Uh, if, if you get a chance to read Trillions, the chapter guide looks very much like a mountaineering climb. A lot of places to go. I think we ultimately end up with vast business opportunities. That's the last chapter. Because anything multiplied by a trillion turns out to be kind of fun. And, and there are a lot of opportunities here. So we are fighting over the last few inches of the current mountain. You know, uh, uh, MySpace has to die for Facebook to win. You know, and we think we've, we've reached the future. We just, we're just waiting for those, you know, flying cars. But in reality, we haven't seen anything yet. We have not seen a thing. Anything multiplied by a trillion turns out to be fun. Um, McKinsey put out a report last year and said that just the Internet of Things, which is a small subset of trillions, just the things, not the places, not the people, not, not, not the communities, just the Internet of Things is going to contribute to between 3 and $11 trillion every year to global GDP. So just harvesting all that exhaust data, pouring off of things, and being able to say I could get better fuel efficiency, being able to say I could actually make something better. And so, so there's a lot of opportunity in this space, and that's what I think I'm most excited about. So I thought it was going to be a sea of information devices. This is the future. Um, but it turns out there, that's just one mega trend, that, that thing called the Internet of Things, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think GE and some other big industrial uh, companies call it the IIoT, the Industrial Internet of Things. It's sort of the Internet of Big Steel and, and how do you actually uh, optimize operations. Um, but it turns out there are some other mega trends. And so now what I'm doing is I'm looking at the intersection of those mega trends. And to do that, I like to run experiments. So I ran an experiment of what about digital fabrication? That's another big me mega trend, all the 3D printing stuff in the world. What about machine learning? Uh, are things are actually starting to have opinions? How does all that come together? So I decided to do an experiment because I really think it's going to be about changing our mindsets. And to understand how to think differently, you have to, you have to actually immerse yourself into it. You have to start practicing it. You have to start just like basketball players practice and doctors practice. You have to get in and practice what the future could be like. So I decided to do an experiment. I, I took a, a silly thing that I like. I like food. 
So I decided to say, what would a nano factory for food look like? And, and what if we could make 10,000 different kinds of food and a new one every two minutes based on personal trends and based on global trends, based on sensing? So I took these big mega trends, the Internet of Things, manufacturing, machine learning, and I slammed them all together and I did a six-week experiment in front of 10,000 of the snarkiest people on the planet. Now this is with a company that has 56 factories, is a $3 billion brand, um, and you probably are familiar with the company. <laughs> So Carl Sagan said, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, first you have to invent the universe. So we, we sort of had to reboot everything we knew about manufacturing and try to have a very different mindset. So I'll, I'll run a little video and then, uh, and then I'll explain it and you guys hopefully will get a little bit of a laugh out of it. It's just a six week experiment in playing around with manufacturing. South by Southwest Interactive in Austin, Texas. We invited festival goers to the Trending Vending Lounge to participate in an experiment. What would happen if your Oreo cookie joins a social network? Our prototype vending machines take what's trending on Twitter and turns those trends into custom Oreos. Using unique transparent touchscreens, users scroll through a list of trending topics, each related to a particular flavor combination and pattern. Advanced algorithms translate the tweets into custom cookies. In all, there are about 10,000 possible combinations. Users can also mash up two trends to further customize the experience. The resulting cookie combines elements of the two original trends. Once the user hits Make Cookie, the real magic happens. Using some repurposed 3D printing technology and a pneumatic pump system, we've enabled festival attendees to watch their custom cookie as it's robotically printed and assembled. Final cookie is dropped into a cup, vended, and is now ready to enjoy. What year South by Southwest do you think that was? You can usually date it by the weird technology people are wearing on their heads. Um, so that was, a, that was about a year or two ago, um, and what was interesting was, it seems a little silly, but Oreo has, has 56 factories. If you were to go to China, you would find out that an Oreo cookie is a rolled gold tube with green tea filling. Uh, it's a $3 billion brand, and they're a love brand, which means you can't screw with them. That cookie has to taste like Oreo, or you're in trouble. It has to be food safe, or you're in trouble. So that was a little experiment, and it was in front of 10,000 of the snarkiest people on the planet. You know, it was at a, a, a festival called South by Southwest. And when things went wrong, we fell on our face. We experimented, but we simulated a year and a week. The first day, we simulated holidays and what the in and outs would look like for a factory that's doing holiday, holiday things. That's actually their biggest, most profitable place. Halloween has cookies that look like a little ghost in, in orange or green and background. We simulated big events like spring break and the Super Bowl. So every day we simulated an entire year and we tested it out. And this is what it looked like when we did A-B testing. We ended up having make your own cookie any way you want it, which was on the left, and then uh, just tune someone else's creation on the right. And it turns out a lot more people like tuning things than making from scratch. It's a little overwhelming to make from scratch. But um, you know, when, when something starts trending, and it was trending in the world, we were using Bluefin Labs actually out of MIT had created live feeds from Twitter to actually look at live events and were giving us feedback and, and people were tuning the algorithms by touching the screen. So, so co-creation by the actual attendees to tune the algorithm so it tasted the way they expected it to taste. When, when star, uh, uh, daylight savings time hit on Sunday, it actually started printing little starbursts of lemon and, and lemon and lime as little sun starbursts. Of course we had to create a quantified snack markup language, you need that. Uh, because it actually has to be an Oreo. It has to have twistability, lickability. Um, but the curious thing was, if you look up at that little HTML markup for, for, for quantified snack marking, um, you'll notice that there's healthy, happy calories. 
That's because Mondelez, the company who owns Oreo and Cadbury and things like that, and, and PepsiCo and Utilever, a few other companies, have basically lowered the price of calories to the entire world in the 20th century. That was the first manufacturing wave. But we didn't make a discretion between good calories and bad calories, and so we saw this broken feedback loop with humans, and we had the rise of diabetes, and we had the rise of obesity, and we had the rise of everything else because we were just giving people basically sugar. And so what was curious about this was people came up and said, well, if I work out really hard, could you give me a sweeter cookie? Or if I don't work out this week, could you give me like volumetrically more cookie and less calories? Could I have healthy, happy calories? Because basically people will still eat Cadbury like on a Wednesday when they need to like go face their kids. Um, you know, so we want healthy and we want happy calories. And with the Internet of Things, we're able to basically say we could take both global trends, but we could actually take personal trends from your body. We could actually look at how to tune something for you. Um, it, it turned out okay for, for Oreo. We teamed up with Twitter and Oreo. Um, we had about 45 million media impressions, which was good for their brand and better than their normal averages. But more importantly, we ended up continuing this effort to say, could they have a billion dollar new line of business dedicated to mass customization and direct to consumer sales? They've never actually taken a credit card. They've never sold directly to a person. They sell to Walmart or they sell to the big stores. So we followed that up with another experiment around custom packaging and built a factory up in uh, Minneapolis, outside of Minneapolis. And we started taking credit cards. Actually, Maya, my lab, had to take the credit cards because, because Oreo didn't have a way to do that for the first week. But within the first week, we ended up collecting $10,000 a day, $10,000 a week, during the holidays, where people were able to actually make their own packages and send them one box at a time to, to, their, um, to their loved ones for the holidays. And that has now scaled out, and they're, they're rolling it out in China. And their, their goal is now a billion dollars of direct-to-consumer mass customization. Now, that doesn't mean they're not going to have these big factories. What it means is the, the little ones, these little nano factories, are going to be sensors. And they're going to find the new trend, and they're going to actually produce limited run, low volume, high customization products that will then seed what they actually should roll up into their big factories where they make millions of cookies a second. So I did this experiment, and it made me think, oh my gosh, these megatrends are not independent. It's not the Internet of Things is over here, new kinds of manufacturing and advanced manufacturing is over here machine learnings over here. No, that was all three of them, and, and it ended up creating something entirely new. So I joined Autodesk uh, as a visiting fellow, so I split my time out in California with Autodesk, who you've probably never heard of, but, um, but if something physical has been made in the world, it was probably authored in their software, uh, from every, I think, building in the world to half the factories and half of the, the shoes and products. And so they're very interested in the digital manufacturing side, and I wanted to get smarter about it. I started realizing that these three big megatrends are coming together and forming almost a primordial soup. These are each independently massive trillion dollar trends, but they're coming together. And they're intersecting to create something new in the world. And I'm talking about the Internet of Things, digital manufacturing, and machine learning. Because those are all fundamental and different, and, and they're actually enabling each other. And I think they're on a collision course. And so my new project and the new book I'm writing is called Primordial. And these are inevitable trends. You're not going to be able to stop them. So let me dive into the soup, and let me explain a little bit about each of the trends and then how I see them coming together, and what they mean, I think, to manufacturing and to the mindset we have to have, both, both for ourselves, for our employees, for the states, for the, for the world, and also for our next generation. So when I talk about the Internet of Things, a lot of people picture, like, the Nest thermostat. Um, and it's really interesting to ask yourself, why did Google, who makes a lot of money without ever having to worry about atoms, and, and warehousing atoms, and getting them out of the ground, and recycling them, why did they buy Nest? And I would posit they bought Nest because they wanted to have an oil well that they could install between your living room and your kitchen, so that they could harvest all the stuff that that wall between your living room and kitchen sees in the form of data. They know not only temperature, they know humidity, because that actually affects your sense of temperature. They know if Bobby's checking the fridge at 3 a.m., they know not only what you're doing, but they know over the next 15 years, because when you sell the house, the, the next people do not get rid of the nest. So they wanted an owned piece of media they could talk directly to you, where they could harvest data about your lives, because if they can do that, they can sell better ads. So they wanted to capture that exhaust data that today is falling on the ground. It's literally oil in the form of information. And I think we're going to see this over and over again. I want to show you, though, when I think of the Internet of Things, this is the simple consumer version. But I want you to think about the profound changes that will happen in the most boring products on the planet when the Internet of Things really starts to take a hold. Here's a little research project out of Carnegie Mellon, and it's starting to be deployed. Um, it's a smart headlight, which doesn't sound very exciting. But I'm just going to show a little snippet to give you a sense of what happens when you actually have computation at the very edges, and you actually have sensing 
at the very edges. Driving at night during a snowstorm is a nightmare. Snowflakes appear as bright flickering streaks and are very distracting. The problem is mainly caused by light from our own headlights reflecting off the snowflakes back to our eye. The solution to this problem is very simple with our headlight. By avoiding illumination of the snowflakes, in other words, streaming light in between the snowflakes, the visibility of the snowflakes will be reduced. This might seem like a crazy idea, but preliminary experiments with artificial snow demonstrate that it is technically feasible while significantly improving visibility with little loss in light. The current prototype is 10 times faster than our previous prototype with much better performance, bringing this technology closer to reality. So give you a sense of what's really happening, and that sounds crazy, but it turns out there's a DLP projector instead of a normal headlight, and there's a camera right in the middle of the DLP projector that's watching the snowflakes using computation and then putting a black pixel over the snowflakes so that it doesn't illuminate it. But it also puts black pixels over the driver's eyes that are coming at you, so you never turn on high beams or low beams. It's always high beam for you, and it's low beam for everybody else. And they tested it with 60, 70 cars coming at you at high speed, and they just put a little black spot right there, that set of pixels. And so they're able to illuminate the road, they're able to illuminate a bicyclist, they're able to do all that stuff, all dynamically, all with an Internet of Things device. So that's what I mean when I say we're starting to get this connected, set, sensed, and connected world. And they're getting smarter and smarter. So every one of those headlights learns from the entire rest of all the headlights out there in the world, because they're connected. So they can get better over time. A lot of industries are going to be impacted. Think of the trillion dollar industry that is, you know, multi-trillion dollar industry that is the automotive world. Here in Massachusetts, a few kids got together in a dorm room and started a social network called Facebook that, that blew up in the world and, and was amazing and now billions of people use it. That was because there was this cloud called the Amazon cloud and you could basically swipe a credit card and start up a business that was digital. But could you swipe a credit card and start up a manufacturing business? And I think that's an interesting question. And in fact, one of the teams I'm working with is called Hackrod, and they're asking just that question. What if three kids in a garage could swipe a credit card, push manufacture, and start up a limited-run car company? <clears throat> so with the Internet of Things, they're starting to actually do things that no car companies today can capture. So for example, they're reality capturing existing cars using structured light. So this is ripping the car the same way we used to rip CDs, putting it into the computer so that you can actually know the the geometry of the actual vehicle. And then putting sensors on it, basically off-the-shelf sensors that cost a few bucks from, from companies like SparkFund, putting sensors on it and then sensing not only the stresses of the metal as it is pulled when it's being driven, but also sensing the EEG rates of the human. This is a $200 EEG system that's connected to the cloud that's a startup that's able to basically track if you're in flow state, if you're feeling stress, if you're feeling excited, and could the car start collaborating with you and, and basically sensing what's happening so that the car can give you a better experience, help an amateur become a, an expert. This is what happened when, and this is mostly interns, by the way, when the interns went out to a field out in the Mojave and raced the car for the first time that they'd started sensing up. They actually captured over four billion data points in the first three hours. So more than Indy captures in a year, more than GM captures. They captured a bunch of 23-year-olds in, in the first two or three hours. And they took that data and they were able to actually look for even the driver, and this is a, a Guinness winning record driver, Maus McCoy. They were able to actually look at when he was planning, when he was executing, when he was in flow state with, with the actual product, when he was uh, confused, and they were able to coordinate that with noises and with sensor data coming off the car. And I'll, a little later in the presentation, show what happens when you take that data and turn it into something that you can manufacture. Here's another Internet of Things kind of thing, a company called Body Media said, what if we could sense the media pouring off your body, just like that exhaust data pouring off that, that nest, um, and actually find the owner's manual for the human body. Now what's interesting is they started doing the sensing, they actually got FDA approval and they're the first clinical device that, that helps people lose weight because they're able to tie it in with, with your fitness trainer or with your community. But they took tens of, tens of thousands of pounds of complex medical equipment, blood oxygen, tracking, things like that. They tested a whole bunch of people with that, tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment. And they boiled it down to six sensors for less than $50. And they replaced all that mass with math. They actually put a bunch of algorithms in place. And they were able to make something that sits on your body. If you've ever seen uh, The Biggest Loser, they're wearing these body bugs that these guys make. Um, they're able to basically sense within 80 or 90% as accurate as, as $100,000 worth of medical equipment 
with $50 worth of sensors and math. And the math gets better over time, which means they can actually mature that because it's connected. They ended up capturing something on the order of 500 trillion data points from their first few hundred thousand people. And they are now starting to show that they can help you lose weight. So it's, it's, it's sensing all over us. That's the Internet of Things. And it's really this feedback loop between sensing and computation and being able to actually evolve the product with it. So digital manufacturing, I think a lot of people know uh, 3D printers. I think last year the Yoda head was the most manufactured thing um, in a 3D printer. Uh, very exciting times for Star Wars. Um, not for the rest of us that actually have to make things. Um, but um, digital manufacturing is interesting. Um, this is a group that we're working with, Jars Larman, uh, in the Netherlands, and they're tuning and teaching industrial robots to be able to 3D print uh, freeform uh, with welders. And their goal is to ultimately uh, print a, a bridge across a canal in Amsterdam. They're going to put the two robots on one side of the canal, and they're going to push go, and they're going to weave a bridge as they climb it. So we're not just talking about small-scale stuff. We're talking about actually very large-scale stuff. I was just out in the desert um, maybe four months ago with a four-meter four meter by four-meter by one-meter high uh, sand printer that was actually fabricating parts of buildings for disaster relief. Um, so, so 3D printing and digital fabrication, it's, it's not about just 3D printing. It's additive, it's subtractive, it's robotic, it's synthetic biology. But it's actually starting to, starting to come into its own because software can now start playing. So that's what those robots are going to do. Um, last year, I don't know how many people have Invisalign retainers or have uh, children that had Invisalign retainers. Um, three million Invisalign retainers were 3D printed last year. So there is no warehouse, there is no stock keeping unit, no SKU for a retainer. Every single one of them was 3D printed. And I think what's interesting to note here is that um, the brand, Invisalign, said, this is what I think it has to be. If this is going to be my product, it has to be clear. This is the experience when you go to the dentist. This is how it's delivered to you. Those are the constants. But they set some sliders, and they said maybe the dentist has to say how tightly I want to tighten your teeth. So this, the dentist actually slides the slider for that product to determine how tight the teeth are, how much it hurts. And then the patient slides the slider saying, this is how many teeth I have in my head. And so this was basically designing a species and letting it evolve in the wild where there is no warehouse. These are manufactured on the fly for every single person. Uh, at Autodesk, we're doing some experiments with enterprise design and manufacturing apps for four-year-olds. And you can download this. I think it's called ThingMaker on, uh, on the App Store for free. But this is what happens when you, when you let kids be able to see how you assemble things, learn how to build stuff. A little lightning bolt shows up. Uh, give it the ability to actually have physics-based joints. Uh, touch on things and color them and make material selections just by touching. Rub on stuff to actually give it different, different textures. Click a button and see what it might look like in context. Click another button and see how it slices it up and manufactures it and how much it'll weigh and how much time it'll take. So, so that's for four-year-olds. So this is what our next generation will be doing. They'll, be, they'll have much better tools than I've ever had for, for product development. Uh, by the way, that system um, prints on any 3D printers or you can click a service bureau and it'll actually just mail it to you overnight but never has support structures, works every time, and you can print like a transmission and snap it, and suddenly it works like a full transmission without assembly. So I look at toys sometimes because sometimes we can see where the future is going by, by looking at very different industries. Um, I'll do one more toy example uh, just to make a point that not only is digital manufacturing changing how we make things, it's also changing how we deliver things. So Barbie is about a $2 billion business. Um, and if you look at Barbie closely, it turns out you can fit about 13,000 Barbie doll boxes in a shipping container, but most of that is empty weight, and it's about 300, uh, 300 um, grams of plastic in that shipping container. But if you just ship the plastic, you could ship the equivalent of 250,000 Barbies, and you could make them locally. And so the way we warehouse, the way we think about things, manufacturing all the way to the other side of the planet because we, get, we have dubious human rights records and we have cheap labor, and then shipping it all the way back over here and leaving it somewhere else and then whatever, while we're also collecting an awful lot of plastic bottles and throwing them in garbage, just seems a little crazy. And probably our grandchildren will have sitcom episodes about this kind of stuff. You know, those people back in the 20th century that shipped entire forests into our mailbox every week. So local, hyper-local manufacturing where you only ship the rarest thing farther than maybe a few miles, I think is likely going to be the way the future comes. Now, to give you a sense, we've talked about these, the, the, the additive manufacturing, one part of digital manufacturing. Um, I just met with some guys in Rome who said, what if 2 billion people have half of a 3D printer 
in their pocket? And what if the other half of the 3D printer cost $99? And they decided to run a Kickstarter for this and, in, and asked for $250,000. In the first three days, they had over a million dollars. And they are now uh, manufacturing, and they're about to ship. And this is what that looks like. You set this little box on top of your phone. Somebody emails you a cool ring or a trinket or something like that. And about three hours later, you snap it off of the phone and you actually put it on. So this is what our kids will be living in, right? We will expect, in fact, an iPad Pro, since it has more resolution, you could have multiple print beds and print the rubber parts here, the clear parts there, whatever. Set an entire factory down on your iPad. Now today, a lot of this 3D printing stuff is actually very dependent on material science. Most of the material science is pretty bad. Um, it turns out most photopolymers like that, which are typically used in the th eight or nine uh, thousand dollar printers, cause mutations in fish in their liquid state, which means they're probably not good for humans. So there are massive opportunities for material science investigation and for new invention there, but we're starting to see this happen. Um, I'll leave you with one more thing about what's happening in digital fabrication. Um, the trend of Internet of Things, which is a world saturated with computing and, and sensing and the ability to do things with it, uh, is now intersecting with the, the world of, of digital fabrication. So this is an $8,000 printer that was premiered at CES last year. And what happens is as you're printing, it says, uh, hey, put in a circuit board. And then it keeps printing. And then it says, put in a battery. Then it keeps printing. Then it says, put in a motor. Put in an LED. Uh, this is actually um, a, a paste, a high conductivity paste that it's assembling. Then it says, go grab your remote control, let's go for a, let's go for a flight. Right? So, so now we've got the intersection of two of these trends. We're, we're building physical things and we're putting computation and actuation into those physical things. By the way, that, that paste was from Harvard uh, research team and the company's out of Toronto. So that gives you a sense of what's coming and we're now starting to see this with very large things. Uh, out in Pittsburgh, where, where my lab is, uh, GE just built a brand new uh, uh, additive manufacturing metal turbine factory, so they're going to just warehouse uh, blueprints and they're going to print the turbine blades when they need them out of titanium. Uh, so machine learning, that's the, the final sort of big mega trend, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, where these all come together. Uh, in the old days when I was growing up, uh, they would call it AI, artificial intelligence, and it was always 10 years away or five years away, and it was always 10 years away, no matter what decade you checked in with the artificial intelligence guys. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> but uh, something happened uh, around 2008 and we crossed the threshold and we've started to see all sorts of amazing things come out. We hit some point of enough infinite computation that machine learning could start to play some interesting games. So you might have heard of uh, AlphaGo. Anybody hear of AlphaGo or the big Go competition? So yeah, so, so that was um, people thought winning at chess, which is what IBM did with Deep Blue. Uh, okay. You could understand that. Chess is a closed game. There are a fixed number of moves. But Go, this, this amazing strategy game that uses little pebbles, sort of black, white stones, uh, there are more moves than, than atoms in the universe. So it might take a while for a computer to beat a human. But uh, about three or four months ago, it was actually telecast live in Korea because it's like a national sport there. Um, Google used all their spare computation power to beat uh, the number one human in the world for Go. So that's one example of... of, of um, machine learning. They use something called a convolutional neural network, which we actually believe is the way our brains work. And they use something called reinf reinforcement learning. They actually had AlphaGo, the computer, play against younger versions of AlphaGo, just like uh, Venus might play against Serena, to reinforce learning and push you farther on the bell curve. And they also played against the 1,000th player in the world and the 900th player in the world and the 800th player in the world. So they, they pulled from the virtuoso side of the bell curve and they pushed from the amateur side and they actually helped uh, AlphaGo learn, which actually I think has some neat implications for how humans will learn in the future as well. Or when I say machine learning, you might think of the self-driving cars. Uh, that's, that's deep learning, machine learning. Um, Mercedes thinks you should probably have a cocktail party in the back of your car. No point in worrying about what's happening out there. But here's the thing, Moore's law tells us, which is the, the law about sort of exponential growth of computation, that whatever's in a car today is in your shoes tomorrow. And so here's a chip, it's like a $10 chip from Qualcomm that does not have any programming. Hopefully you're not having your kids go think they're going to have jobs as programmers. Um, this one, you just give it a carrot or a stick. You raise the product like you raise a child. And it uses naturally uh, simulated uh, neural networks. So you say, good robot, go over, find that white one, bad robot. All learning, all memory decisions, all of it is, is raised. You raise the child, as you raise the product as a child. No writing any code. 
$10 chip, not even connected to the internet. Um, and so, so it's all using something called neural networks. And we're starting to see this with actually designing physical things as well. Uh, we've got a research project at, at the uh, office of the CTO at, at Autodesk called Dreamcatcher, where you just slide some sliders and you set all the goals for the, for this, for the city you want to make, for the, for the housing development you want to make, for the product you want to make, all the goals. It needs to be recycled 50%. It needs to have this closeness to, to renewables. It has to have this, it has to have this. And then it uses genetic algorithms to generate millions of children based on those goals. All these trade-offs that we normally humans can't, can't do. And we're collaborating with a robot in the form of a, of, of a um, genetic algorithm to find it. For products, I say the goal is I want four legs or I want a stool that can support 200 pounds and it's got a, a seat right around here. It's a stool so it's like 40 inches high. And then it evolves it using genetic algorithms and goes from something like 10 kilograms down to 2 kilograms. So saving me material, saving me cost, and manufacturing something that you couldn't even manufacture with a normal tool, but is trivially easy to manufacture with a 3D printer. So that's the, thing, the, the sort of thing we're starting to see now with machine learning. It's affecting every industry. Uh, I'll show you what happened. Remember those kids that were actually trying to sense up and see if they could start up a car company? Uh, we actually took all their data, their 4 billion data points that they started collecting, and their reality captured vehicle, and we actually fed it into Dreamcatcher to see what would happen. Could it evolve a better chassis? And so this is what happened when we started to take that data. We took all the data, all the points, and we started looking at it and basically saying these are the forces, and it would evolve it based on the forces. So it's forms follows forces. And it started doing the computation. It started with like a chunk of aluminum and said, could I carve away things? Or it started with a chunk of titanium and carved it away. And you'll actually start to see what happens as it starts taking all those data points, basically looking at why did you make decisions about some stress somewhere. <clears throat> and so here, here's that raw chunk of aluminum, basically where all the obstacles are, and it starts evolving the chassis the same way like a horse's hip evolved over time, with the forces of the muscles pulling on it in different ways. Um, then we said, we slid a slider and said, well, what would it would look like if it was made out of titanium? Would it actually look very different? What would it look like if it was made out of aluminum, titanium, or what if it was out of chrome moly, out of its traditional methods? And so evolving it, and in the very first pass, we got from a 400-pound frame to a 290-pound frame, and stronger, and went through stress tests stronger than the original one. <clears throat> so these kids are using all this data to start looking at, is it really possible? And, and that's, that's called hack rod. It's kind of an exciting little experiment. But it's going to change everything as we start to see how this stuff comes along. I'll show you one more uh, piece about machine learning, and then we'll talk about how it all comes together. <clears throat> if you think of um, Facebook has the social graph of your friends. And if you look at LinkedIn has the social graph of your career. And if you look at Google, it has the social graph of links. You know, that's, it's sort of uh, very good at finding links to other things on the web. One of the things we started doing an experiment about a year ago was what, could we, what would happen if we had the social graph of things, you know, the stuff we manufacture? What if we could actually look at how these things are connected? So here's something that we just premiered. It's called Design Graph. It's a free tool that works off the cloud. Um, I searched for cars. <coughs> cars are actually mostly made of axles, uh, lots of things that pivot. And if I click on it, it automatically figures out the groupings. It says lots of gears go with this gear, usually goes with that gear. These nuts usually go with those bolts. And it starts to form a social graph of things automatically from all your data. So instead of trying to an organize all your catalog entries and things like that, it's actually guessing based on convolutional neural networks, looking at the geometry, what these things are. So think of this. It picks up, like if, if, if I'm a baby, this is, this is kind of how this thing works. It's very much like how children work. Um, if you wanted to teach German to your child, you could try Rosetta Stone. Uh, you could teach them grammar. You could teach them a list of words. You could teach them common phrases. And they would never learn German very well. Or you could send them to Germany for six months. And they would be immersed in the data, and they would learn German. And this is the same thing we're starting to see with machine learning. If I take all the data in the entire world of, of actually geometry, and I immerse a little childlike machine learning algorithm into it. It starts teething. So it starts biting on like cylinders and goes, ah, this, this thing here, it's biting on this, biting on it. And then it sees a lot of tags that say cylinder. Then it finds like bumpy cylinders and it says, I think these are gears. And over time, it teethes to the point where it actually learns the physical world. And then when you put your own data into it, we throw away all that other data. We really don't want to share like GE's turbine engine data. We throw all that away. We throw the identity away, just like you put away your childhood things. But now you've got a teenager that can actually learn and you start putting data into it. So this is effectively like giving uh, 
a 19-year-old the power of 10,000 engineers at their fingertips. We call it autocomplete for the physical world because as you start drawing a bracket in the sidebar, it starts showing you the bolts and nuts that typically go with that bracket. It starts showing you the rest of the social graph. So it's sort of autocomplete. So that's machine learning, and it's changing everything. Um, and it's just one more of these megatrends. And by the way, because we have the Internet of Things, all of our things are starting to have opinions, and they have sensors to actually test those opinions. So those machine shop tools you make probably are going to actually try to come up with assertions, hypotheses of their own to actually optimize the machine process so they can build it better, the same way that your, your kids are trying to figure it out. So we are moving from an era of manufacturing that is largely a static equilibria. Think of it as like holding, holding a pool cue and it settles down. I make my manufacturing approach, I set up my factory, I negotiate all my channels, I get my sales approach, I get my business model, and it just sort of settles down into a pendulum. It's a static equilibria. Please do not change the world, because if the world changes, I'm not ready for it. You know, if, if I'm holding like this and somebody bumps me, I drop it, I, you know, I, it, it's not really reactive to a new era that is like balancing a pool cue on your finger. It's really interesting to think of that. That's an era of static to an era of dynamic equilibria. So if I balance a pool cue on my finger, it actually takes a lot more work. But what's curious about it is if it's windy, I can keep balancing. If somebody bumps me, I can keep balancing. I can actually practice and get better at it. But to do that, it's kind of like the difference between a, a dove that's just flying, which is static, or a hawk comes to attack the dove and it flaps away. And that's what happened in nature. Nature was able to do trade-offs between static and dynamic equilibria. And I think we're now approaching an era of manufacturing where we can now do trade-offs between static and dynamic equilibria. That means we'll be much better prepared for the next wild trend that comes out, but it also means we need to have a different mindset. <clears throat> Curiously enough, to balance a pool cue on my finger, I need machine learning. It's human machines. But I need to be able to get better. I need to be able to move my hand. That's the additive manufacturing and 3D printing and digital fabrication. I need to change things. That's robotics and everything. And I need to sense. I need my eyes to look at the right thing or else I can't do it. And so those are the three big megatrends that we're starting to see coming together. And it actually just now is enabling this primordial soup. And I think there's some new spark that's going to come that's going to change everything. So if you look at it as a holistic approach, these are some of the things that are going to change in your world. We're going to have entirely new kinds of value because anything multiplied by a trillion turns out to be a good number. And you'll be able to harvest lots of little bits of information over lots of little things. We'll have the Internet of Things, we'll have digital manufacturing, we'll have machine learning, but also a lot more co-creation. A lot more that you will be creating something with your customers, with your clients, with your end users. It will be designed for loss of control rather than designed for complete control. But that will make you more agile and more future-proof. And in fact, McKinsey's other part of their report that said there were trillions of dollars of, of actual economic impact said that 40% of that money was going to come from playing together with others. You cannot be part of an ecosystem standing on the outside. You have to be in the flow. And I think that means that we're going to actually have a lot more flow. Being open is going to turn out to be far more economically valuable than being closed. Now, um, in Trillions, we talked about a whole chapter on biomimicry for information systems. And I know your brains are probably hurting because it took me a while to figure this stuff out. Um, and I'm just trying to give you kind of a high-speed um, overview. But if you were to take a particular product, like a particular kind of wine grape, and you were to plant it in my hometown in Chicago, and then try to make wine out of it, would it be good? Anybody? No, no. It would not be good. I like my hometown. Um, it has pretty crappy soil, um, particularly if you were to plant on the south side. There'd be all sorts of other stuff happening <laughs> where my first apartment was. Um, but curiously enough, if you take that same exact product, that wine varietal, that set of genes that was in that grape, and you plant it in the south of France, you end up with something that's actually pretty high value. The product gains economic value by where it is located in the world because there's a feedback loop. The worms actually change how that product grows. The water, the wind, the sunlight, nature and nurture play a role in the evolution of rich ecologies. And so it's likely that because we're going to have sensing and feedback and machine learning and things like that, that we'll actually start to see the shaping of our products by the environment they're in. So a car that's being driven out in the desert all the time is going to probably evolve very differently than a car that's just a, a daily commuter, that you really just want someone to drive you. And so us being able to sense that is going to give us new feedback and new economic value. It's likely we'll have something like, like Bitcoin running in all of our things. That's another talk altogether. But I'll give you a sense of what I mean by that for even workforce development and for your factory. 
we did a little experiment where we said, what if the environment itself could sense what you were trying to do when you were manufacturing something? So we took an Instructable, which is basically like an online tutorial to make an electromechanical uh, product. And we did time trials, and we also tested how often experts had to actually get involved in helping you build this. So we took people that didn't know how to make complex electronic physical things, and we did time trials. And then what we did was we built this little, little um, work uh, bench where we sensed the Dremel tool where they were going to cut. We sensed the soldering iron. We sensed if you had the goggles on. We actually put LEDs in all the tool bins, and we sensed if you took an LED or if you took a, a wrench. Um, we could sense every part. When you set it on the table, we could actually tell what the part was. And we gave you uh, the information in context. And what we saw in the very first set of trials, we, we saw a 47% reduction in expert interventions. So a person learning how to actually build a complex thing that you could really hurt yourself with like a, a drill or a soldering iron, 47% reduction in expert intervention. So what does that mean in terms of upskilling your, your people in your factories, upskilling your, your teammates, if the space itself is helping shape it? That's that nature nurture. And what if I took that little toy that we had uh, for kids, that enterprise manufacturing app, and I gave it to the 20-somethings that are actually starting to want to push a button and spin up a car company? What if it could automatically slice it up and say, these are the carbon fiber components, these are the recycled components, these are the aluminum components, these are the ones I can find within five miles, these are the ones I have to make or have Ford make the engine? And what if that factory was not a place, but it was a social network? What if it really was a, a very different thing? If you think about it this way, if you think about manufacturing is really an ecology, and, and Jay, you said a little bit about that, right? These are ecologies and ecosystems. Then we actually have to take that seriously. <clears throat> and ecologies and economies both live on the edge of chaos. And they allow for the freedom for agents to act on and exploit underused resources. That's that exhaust data pouring off the ground that Nest was able to harvest. That's entrepreneurs basically trying to figure out somebody else isn't exploiting this information. I could exploit it, and I could be an entrepreneur, and I could start something new. And they also need liquidity to grow and flow. A, a market doesn't work if it's static. It has to flow, and that's where the information has to start being shared. And so at the end of the day, I start asking myself, how do we put people first? How do we shape a world of effectively networked matter? This is a new kind of material in the world. We're going from dumb material to material that can, that can be manufactured differently to sensing material, to sensing and computation, to sensing actuation and computation, to comp computronium, basically. This is a new kind of matter in the world that we're entering. It's a new era. And how do we put people first? Right? Technology is fine, but if the 20th century was we can make anything and we can make it right, the 21st century is probably going to be more about let's make the right thing. And at that point, you have to say the right thing for who? Because it'll be way too easy to make things. And we're going to actually have to practice restraint. So it's a very different era that we're coming in. And I wonder how we prepare. So for the last five minutes or so, I thought I'd talk a little bit about how you guys might want to get ready. One thing you could do is looking at adding a lot more sensors to everything you're doing. Because there is exhaust data pouring on the ground like industrial waste from your products, from your machinery, from your factories, from every single part of, of, the, of, the, of the ecosystem you're in. And I think if you really want to join that information carbon cycle, just like the real carbon cycle, you know, your waste is someone else's food. And, and that's really important to remember. That's how we, how we get liquidity. Your next 10 hires, maybe you want to actually go hire some machine learning interns, no matter what your company is. Um, I brought in three or four from some different parts of the world last year, and they started building code to, to be able to do that hack rod. And it's amazing little examples. I just met with uh, the uh, CTO for Health and Human Services of the Obama administration, Susanna Fox. And she has a 10, uh, I'm sorry, $100,000 little award to go to entrepreneurs inside the government that come up with new ideas. And this small group of people, I was there for the pitch day, the small group of people came in from the CDC, and they said it takes 1,700 hours uh, to analyze a particular site in the country for autism rates for children. 1,700 hours by an analyst. And then we can come up with a prediction. You know, it's five out of every 100 kids have autism. This is what it was in 2010, et cetera. They took off-the-shelf machine learning algorithms over weekends, and they ended up building a system that, that does the analysis in less than a second, 87% accurate. The, the, Normal analysts are 90% accurate. Um, and they tested it on 2010 data. Uh, they trained it on 2010 data. Then they tested it on 2014 data. So here's something that takes 1,700 hours by people who really know what they're doing, going down to one second with a close to the same accuracy. So now those analysts can actually work on a lot more sites. We can actually get a lot more data. We can do other things. So machine learning is going to change everything. And I think the quickest way you could do this is just get an intern 
and you won't even understand what they're doing. Um, but, you know, point them at all your data, because chances are you're not doing a damn thing with that information. <coughs> I think the other thing is foster emergence, right? Look for ways to experiment with partners and simulate an entire year in a week, because so, you can't predict the future. What you can do is you can actually simulate, just like a Petri dish, you can spin it up. You can, you can simulate a year in a week, a week in a day. You can simulate the business model. You can simulate the bad guys. You could have a guy named Murphy, and their whole job is throwing wrenches. <coughs> I know in Boston that should be good. Got to have Murphy's Law. Um, so, so think about what you could do. And I think if we think about this, this is the, the phase change that we're about to go through. We are going from tools being one size fits all to tools being context-based and generative. They're, they're, they're generating things based on the, the goals you have. That's that setting a few goals and sliding some sliders and then evolving things. Jobs are going from one or two careers in your life to basically automation disrupting all jobs. Absolutely no question. And that means it's going to be different for you and for your children. We're going from a design approach that largely is waterfall. The designer hands it to the engineer, hands it to the supply chain guy, and, 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 and that to radical collaboration. We're moving from monolithic factories as, as manufacturing to social networks, collaborative social networks of fabricators, whether it's the little tech shop or the, the fab lab or whether it's the very large thing. It's all part of a spectrum. It's not independent. We're moving from business models that sell things to business models that sell experiences, the richness of the experience and the things that can come from it and the benefits. We're going from customers that are users to customers that are always learning and maybe even customers that are machines and humans learning together. The story that I didn't tell about that AlphaGo is actually about economic development meets workforce development. So um, if you read this Wired article about AlphaGo having a computer that beat humans, it turns out that they interviewed uh, one of the top 1,000 players. And about eight months ago, he was beat by AlphaGo. I mean, he beat it for a long time. He was number 633 in the world. And he beat it, he beat it, he beat it, and then one day, AlphaGo beat him, and he never won again. And he went back and he lost face. It took him decades to get to top, top 1,000. He was demoralized. He literally was like having nightmares when he went home because his job, in his mind, his whole, his whole life was about being an amazing Go player. Then he started having dreams a few days later. And then he started thinking about all the moves that AlphaGo made that he never even thought about, whole categories of spaces that he never explored. And he went back to Google and he actually said, could I join the team? I just am going to be on the other side of the bell curve. I'll be on the amateur side trying to get better and, and be dragged up by AlphaGo. Six months later, when the number one Go player in the world was beat by AlphaGo, number 633 in the, in the, in the article is now 300th in the world. So in six months, he's actually gotten twice as good as anyone else on the planet because he's been collaborating with the robots. He's been, he's been playing together as, in a high-performance team, and we're now starting to see this, pushing our brains to do new kinds of things. So I don't think we're going to be looking at the world as, you know, send people out for a K through gray education, maybe get a degree, uh, pump you out like a factory, get a certification, and you stay in the same job for your whole life. You know, this sort of if-this-then if approach to education that was designed for the 20th century. It's likely we'll have learners. And those learners might be human learners, and those learners might be machine learners, and those human and machine learners are probably going to get together in teams that are high-performance teams, that are machine and human team mates together, because machine learners are really stupid about a bunch of things. They never scratched their knee. They never had that weird aunt who always took you to the symphony. Um, but the cool thing is, together, we might be able to dream bigger dreams and ask better questions. I'd like computers to run cities, frankly. Sorry. I, I'd like them to figure out when to build a new bridge because I want to go to Alpha Centauri. I think we need to be dreaming much bigger about what we could do and let the robot automation stuff handle the automation stuff. We have, we have a chance here. And I think the environments themselves are going to be learners as well. And I think if we take that real seriously, just, just like that example I showed, we can start thinking very differently. And every one of them probably assigns a credential or microcredit or senses itself as a machine to figure out how to actually optimize it. So when I think about learning, I think we're going to go through, from education that's K through grade, K through 12 to K through gray. You are going to be a lifelong learner because there will always be a new interesting job as automation disrupts jobs. It's just the right person won't be in the right place at the right time with the right skills. So we need to really think about how do we actually upskill people dynamically over their whole life. I have no way to simulate how all my possible futures, and it would be wonderful if we could. I think we're going to go from standard tests to testing the portfolio, testing the avatar, testing the system. If you look at all video games, 
They test the, the player thousands of times a second and keep you in a little zone called the, flows, the flow state zone. It's fun, it's desirable difficulties. And I think we'll do the same. We're gonna go from proof being degrees to proof being lots of little deep learning micro-credentials for everything you do. From teams being silos of human experts to machine, human, ad hoc teams. From teaching being sage on the stage to collaborative peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, coursework going from majors, which were great for the 20th century, to missions, which actually weave together lots of different kinds of, of knowledge and skills. A focus on things to a focus on systems, because everything I've talked about this morning has been about system thinking. <clears throat> and ultimately, frameworks being from fixed if-then path, this is how I'll get my degree at Harvard, to emergent, simulated, and infinite paths, so I can actually think about the future I want to live and find out lots of ways that I could prepare for it now. So I will end there. I will say we need to learn to make. We need to make to learn. <clears throat> These new tools are going to give us power only if we actually become literate and fluent. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>